Good morning. I'm Dwayne Marsh, uh, the new CEO and president of NCG. How new? Well, we're still counting it in days, not weeks. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, while new to the organization, no, I am not, I'm not new to the work. I bring 27 years of commitment to advancing racial justice in a variety of settings, including public, nonprofit, and philanthropic institutions. I was drawn to this role for several reasons. Primarily, this is the moment where we need all the philanthropy to be its best self, and NCG can support that sector transformation. Now, make no mistake, this is a movement moment, a time when our choices define how our efforts to improve communities will be tested and where we'll have to confront the painful truth that unless we address racism pervasive throughout our systems and structures, we won't fulfill the lofty missions that most of our institutions promote. Honestly, I was also drawn to conversations like this, where direct engagement with those making change can help us sharpen our own practice towards meaningful impact on the ground in communities. Now, during this conversation, you'll have the opportunity to post questions in the Q&A function, and we'll get to many of those that we can cover. But right now, I'm going to get a chance to introduce our primary speaker, Alicia Garza. I've had the privilege to share the stage with Alicia in conversations like this, and trust me, you're in for an experience. Alicia is an author, political strategist, organizer, and cheeseburger enthusiast. She founded the Black Futures Lab to make Black communities powerful in politics, co-created Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Global Network, an international organizing project to end state violence and oppression against Black people. That network now has more than 40 chapters in countries around the world. She also serves as the strategy and partnership director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the nation's premier voice for millions of domestic workers in the United States. Additionally, she's the co-founder of Supermajority, a new home for women's activism. Thank you for joining our annual conference, Alicia, for corporate philanthropy and corporate social responsibility practitioners. We're pleased to have you here to share your insights and wisdom with this audience, which is challenged, like many of us, to advance change in this movement moment. Let's get started. Hey, Dwayne, it's so good to be here with you today. And hi to the Northern California grant makers. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you start off, just uh, bring it home for us. How are you doing? How are you sustaining yourself in this moment that we're in right now? Yeah, it's a loaded question these days, to be honest. But today I'm feeling good. I'm feeling hopeful and I'm feeling motivated. We've got about three weeks um, to one of the most important elections in a lifetime. And so everything is centered for me around that and making sure that we leave it all on the field. So my spirit is good, um, my energy is high and the way that I'm keeping it there most days <laughs> is um, trying to be active every day. I'm like a, Pel a Peloton enthusiast. And um, I'm also cooking really good meals and um, spending time with friends. And of course, enjoying the weather here in the Bay Area, which has been quite nice over the last week and clear air, which has also been nice. I think we all have a new and deeper appreciation for good weather in the Bay Area. So thank you for that. Definitely. What do you think makes this moment different? Uh, what are the opportunities we have really for wise scale change? Well, I think that this moment is a reflection of many, many, many years of pain and anguish and frankly, rigged rules that have kept our communities out and left our communities behind. And, you know, I've been saying recently that in my lifetime, um, I've been fortunate enough to see the election of the first Black president ever um, in the history of this country. And I've also been fortunate enough to be a part of now two major explosions of this movement. And I feel really humbled to be the smallest piece of its inception. But with that being said, I think um, what is different this time around is that this movement is growing. Um, certainly, you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement grew to international scale, uh, you know, years ago. But what I think we're seeing in this particular moment is an expansion of this movement beyond the typical activists um, that become part of movements. Uh, we're seeing an incredible diversity across race and gender, age, all the different demographics in our country um, and globally. And I think that this time around, we're starting to make stronger connections. Uh, you know, this morning, someone asked me, you know, what do you do when 
this movement gets pinned as mostly being about police violence. And I say, you know, police violence is really just the effect, right, of the many causes that uh, have been shaping Black communities for quite a long time. And so I think that what's happening is we're starting to connect those dots. Um, and so those are things that are different. I think there are some things that are also, frankly, the same. Um, you know, what happens when we uh, see the most visible expressions of movements is a lot of us clamor to try and be a part of it. And, you know, in April, you know, I was living a pretty regular life again. <laughs> and by May, everything had exploded and my phone was going off all the time and people were wanting to know, how can I be a part of this? But there were some actually that um, just, frankly, I'll be fully honest, I'm feeling blunt today. Um, frankly, wanted to just kind of cut corners, right? They wanted to put Black Lives Matter on their website. They wanted to send out statements about how they support Black Lives Matter, but they hadn't actually gone through the kind of transformational change that is necessary to make Black Lives Matter something more than a symbol. And as a result, I think what we saw, at least early on in this moment, um, was an explosion of people wanting to learn more, people wanting to understand more. And I've been joking and saying to people, you know, after the end of a very long day, you know, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., um, I would flop down on my couch and turn on my favorite reality shows just to like escape for a little bit. But I couldn't even escape in my reality shows. I mean, I'm trying to watch Real Housewives of Atlanta <laughs> and I'm not actually trying to have some big analysis about what's happening. I just want to like tune out. And, you know, here are these reality shows that are having these deep conversations about race and justice in America. So, I mean, I think that what we're seeing is this tension between symbol and substance. And, you know, I've had a lot of, of inquiries about, you know, can I come to, you know, said conference or said luncheon or said meeting and, you know, talk about diversity and inclusion. And I've often just said, no, um, that's not actually the work that I do. And, you know, that I don't think that that's actually what's being called for right now. I think we're being called to have a reckoning. And that reckoning is very much about what are the policies and practices that endure that allow these kinds of conditions to continue and sustain for black communities and what kinds of shifts are necessary personally, politically, institutionally in order to actually make black lives matter everywhere we are. Great, thank you. And I wanna come back to that notion of symbol and substance. I think that's really important. But I wanna talk about the Black Futures Lab for a moment. I know you started that two years ago to help advance local, state and federal level policies that make black communities stronger. Can you share a bit about the evolution of that work that led you to create this new entity? Certainly. Well, I started the Black Futures Lab in 2018, and the goal of our work is to make Black communities powerful in politics so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. And the inception of this work really comes from more than 20 years of organizing in Black communities, where so often, right, um, we are talked about, we are talked around, but we are rarely talked to and rarely engaged with. And the result of that is twofold. On the one hand, our communities have become incredibly cynical about the ability of our current uh, ways of being organized. Uh, we are cynical about whether or not these current containers can actually deliver the kinds of changes that we long for. And on the other hand, what it means is that the farther the gap grows between our communities and being able to shape the decisions that impact our lives, the more our democracy erodes. And so for black people to have our conditions improve, we need to be powerful in the processes that are making the rules. And so, you know, we started our work with a project called the Black Census Project. It's the largest survey of black people in America in 155 years. And we listened, we trained black led grassroots organizations in 28 states 
to um, administer this survey and use it in the service of their organizing. We trained 106 Black organizers. We talked to more than 30,000 Black people from every demographic, and we learned a ton about what it is that we experience every day. But more than that, we learned a lot about what it is that we want for our futures. We didn't just stop there though. We took that information and we turned it into a black agenda where we wanted to make very, very clear for legislators and policymakers, how do we make Black Lives Matter from City Hall all the way up to Congress? So we designed that black agenda and then we used it as an organizing tool and we're using it now leading up to um, this really pivotal election cycle. What we're finding is that more of our communities feel like politicians don't care about our communities. Every single person that we talked to in the survey said, nobody ever asks me what I think or what I experience. Um, and the things that came out of that survey were incredibly profound. Um, you know, if you were to be like an alien dropped into uh, the United States during an election season, you would think that the only thing Black folks care about is soul food brunches, um, you know, criminal justice reform, and possibly, uh, you know, decriminalizing marijuana. But what we found was that actually the number one issue keeping our communities up at night is wages that are too low to support a family, followed by um, the lack of access to affordable health care, and followed quickly after that by the lack of access to affordable housing. So what we've done is we've created this agenda and we're organizing our communities around it, using it as a tool to motivate people to show up at the polls and using it as a tool for people to be able to evaluate who they think deserves to represent them. Finally, we've done a ton of work around political education and making sure that our communities have easy, accessible and reliable access to information given that black voters are being targeted every single day on social media platforms by misinformation and disinformation. And then of course, we had to start making plans for after the election. What we know is that no matter who's in the White House, we still have opportunities to change the rules. And so this year we launched our Black to the Future Public Policy Institute, where we are currently training 41 Black fellows from nine states across the nation. And we're training us how to write, win and implement policy in cities and states. And starting in January of next year, uh, our fellows are actually developing and designing policy campaigns right now. And starting in January of next year, we're going to deeply invest in three of those campaigns and help lead them to victory. So that's the work that we do. And we see ourselves as a critical part of the infrastructure that is necessary to really turn protest into power. So you started to talk about this a little bit in what you were saying these platforms that are emerging from real communities with people, what should those of us charged with corporate social responsibility keep in mind about those platforms? What's the role that we have to play in those calls for justice? Yeah, well, the first, the first thing, honestly, is I think the role of grant makers and the role of uh, corporate actors in this process is to do the internal work necessary to create equity. You know, so many of the platforms that I use every single day have zero black people in the C-suite. Um, so many of the platforms that I use every single day have zero black people in, in senior management and leadership. And yet it's black communities that make those platforms powerful. It's black communities that use those platforms to be able to shape and shift culture and as a result to shape and shift the rules. And so I think as a corporate actor, it's important for people to understand that um, even if you're putting Black Lives Matter on your website, if your policies and your practices are harming Black people, then there's a gap there that you have to be able and willing to close in order to take that assertion of Black Lives Matter from symbol to substance. I think the other thing that's really important, frankly, is to um, get familiar with the work of movement building. You know, we got a ton of corporate donations in the beginning of this uprising. People, everybody wanted to support Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's so, you know, for the Black Futures Lab, we were getting a lot of inquiries. How can we support your work? We want to give you money. And then we would get these phone calls that were like, okay, so what can we do? 
And it was almost as if people expected us to talk about like a trash pickup on the side of a freeway or, you know, a food giveaway. And I had to explain to people over and over again, the work that we do is not charity work and it's not service work. That work is important, but frankly, the work that we do is trying to get to the root of why people are poor, trying to get to the root of why people don't have the things that they need. We work on changing policies, we work on changing rules, and we work on changing lives. And that work is a sustained commitment, not a weekend, not a day long cleanup. And I think this is important because frankly, it indicates that so much of how we see social change is very skewed. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we can look at Black communities as, um, people we should feel bad for, as opposed to um, people we should take guidance and leadership from in terms of how it is that we can reshape this society to be more equitable for all of us, not just for Black people. So I think there's a role here in really internalizing these principles and these values by doing the work inside of your own space, by learning more about what it means to build power in communities and what are the tools that we need to be able to do so and by making long-term commitments to the organizations that are rebuilding the infrastructure that has been defunded for more than 30 years now. Um, that I think are the top three things um, that corporate actors can do in this moment to really help move this movement forward. Well, in that last sentence, been our conversation and you would really brought it home, but I have more questions and some from the audience. For, for decades, we've faced this challenge of far too many people being able, unable to wrap their minds around the issues you're trying to address. And that all changed in this one fateful summer. I'm curious how you're managing the explosion of millions of people suddenly having an expanded awareness of structural racism that's embedded in so many of our systems. I presume it's an opportunity, but I'm also betting it can be challenging. Can you just share a couple of reflections on how you've navigated that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? And I, I think the takeaway for me is we have deep, deep reckoning to do around how we understand racism. And I think so much of the gap happens because again, we have this conception that racism is something that bad people do. We assume, right, that um, racism is a function of personalities gone wrong as opposed to policies and practices. And I think we also assume that Racism is something bad about, but we shouldn't talk about. And the less that we talk about it, the more it can just go away. I mean, it's similar to like what the president has been saying these days, right? The more testing we do, the more cases there are. So we should just stop testing. Well, that's illogical and irrational. If we want to address a problem, you have to first acknowledge that it exists. And then you have to start to study how it operates. And I think that we have started to acknowledge that it exists in the last decade, but our study and our ability to become scientists around the ways in which it operates um, has been incredibly stunted. And it's been stunted, it has been stunted by um, the very deliberate stories that we tell about race and racism in this country as being a shame as opposed to deliberate, uh, as being uh, something that it is too bad as opposed to being something that's completely preventable if there were political and social will attached to it. Um, so I, I think for me in this moment, the way that I'm navigating these um, reckonings is by A, trying to have generosity and patience with it. Um, you know, as a black woman in America, I'm like, I've always been aware that racism exists along with all kinds of other um, systems of, of oppression and systems of power. Um, but I think being patient with the process uh, that people go through where they are unlearning the stories that they've been taught since they were this big about how race operates in our country and coming to the acknowledgement, right? That not only is racism something completely different than what you thought, but that um, it's not out of your hands. <laughs> it's not something that A, you can leave to somebody else to deal with, but certainly um, it's not something that you have no control over. And then finally, I would say, you know, just to reiterate this point, um, the thing that I have seen over and over again over the last decade is a real praising of this movement and people saying things like, good luck with your movement. You know, I'm proud of you guys. And it's like, wait a minute, this isn't gonna work if it's just my movement. If this isn't something that you believe is going to make your life better and therefore you become committed to contributing to, 
we're going to keep going through these same cycles for time immemorial. So it's time for us to stop looking at these um, incidents as isolated, as cases of bad apples, right? And start looking at it as deeply embedded in the fabric of our society and something that permeates the air that we breathe, quite literally, for those of us in California. Have you seen regional differences across the country as you go around in terms of how the work is happening and how, did, how has that played out for you? Sure, I mean, there's differences because the infrastructure is way different. Um, and this is something important for grant makers and corporate actors to understand. You know, when we started Black Lives Matter seven years ago, what I can say is that um, one of the reasons that we did is that we just saw there was a real dearth in, in infrastructure for Black organizing. Um, I talk about this a little bit in my book, how, you know, for the last two decades or so, because of the weird stories that we tell ourselves about race, we've also started to invest in what I call a pretty flaccid multiracialism mm -hmm. um, that values diversity and representation more than it values transformation, power, and change. And so it means, right, that we can um, be completely fine with, um, you know, um, having organizations that, that address the needs of people of color, but be very deeply uncomfortable when we start talking specifically about building political power for Black people. Um, it, it can lead to this what about ism that I think is incredibly unhelpful. When we look at the project of social change, we have to look at it almost like a recipe, right? And of course, with any recipe, there's art and then there's science. You certainly can't put in a cup of sugar when the recipe asks for a tablespoon, but there are tweaks and things that we make. You might add a little lemon juice to brighten the flavor, et cetera. Well, when we look at movements, we've got to look at it at the same way. If communities don't have the infrastructure that they need to be powerful, including organizations that people can go to, right, and become members of that are fighting to change the rules, it's not possible to change the imbalance of power. And so when we're looking at how we spread out resources, we should just understand very deeply, uh, you know, um, there's less infrastructure in places like the Midwest or in the South than there is on the coast. Why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with the flow of capital and resources. Um, and even when we talk about infrastructure, we also expect infrastructure to look the same in each place. The, the, the particularities of organizing in any region is very specific to its time, place, and conditions. And so, you know, using the South again as an example, um, sometimes what we do is we say, okay, we're just going to throw all of our money in the South, um, but not really respect the ways in which people um, have organized themselves in their particular time, place, and conditions. And so what that leads to is building infrastructure that doesn't stick and won't last because it's not appropriate um, for the context. And so I, I think what we have to keep in mind here is that you know, what Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives and, and so many other um, actors in this space have been able to do is create power building fabric in communities that really reflects what those communities need, who those communities are and how they relate to each other. And I think as grant makers, as corporate actors, we need to be able to say um, that what we are going to do is move resources and get out of the way. <laughs> And I'm offering that to say, you know, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we are treating people like they are experts. And, you know, I don't know anything about what it means to um, organize in rural Alabama. So why would I, as, a, as an Oaklander, give money to an organization in rural Alabama and then try to tell them how to do their work. No, I wanna give them money so that they can amplify what they're doing and expand it and extend it. Um, but I also wanna be able to take their lead and let them tell me what's going to work and what's not going to work. And I also wanna be able to give them the ability to be flexible and to try things um, and to fail. Right. I mean, with the Black Futures Lab, we're an experimentation and innovations lab, and we pride ourselves on trying things and failing fast so we can move that out of the way and try something else. Um, our communities are in desperate need of the right strategies and the right tools to build power in a moment that is unprecedented in this country. And it means for those of us who move capital um, that we have to take that mandate seriously, but also um, know our role and know our lane. 
So I just want to take a moment to appreciate something you said earlier about uh, generosity and patience. And I'm in my own work in working in government, trying to transform institutions around race. Often we'd see African American women in particular were the anchors who had to endure the entire arc of that experience. And as awakening would happen, were turned to again to carry the load and the fatigue that would come from that. So just deeply appreciate your staying in the midst of that in this moment of wider awakening. We've got time for probably just a couple more brief questions. And there have been a couple about how you keep your focus, and especially in this environment with things coming out like the executive order on critical race theory or other pronouncements from the White House trying to kind of uh, dramatize or publicize this issue versus trying to address it. How do you guys stay the course in the midst of all that going on? Well, we're used to being used as a political football. This isn't the first time. Um, and, you know, as frustrating as it is, I will say that this old dog has not learned new tricks. And so um, we have the benefit, right, of having perspective and having this experience from the last election cycle. Um, I, I think that, again, this is a question that gears towards why we have to have strong movements. If our movements are weak, then there are a small number of people trying to fight on many fronts, and we all know that that's not effective. So it's imperative, right, that if we are going to be able to navigate on all these different fronts, that we really focus on the practice of addition and multiplication as opposed to subtraction and division, <laughs> just to make it very plain and simple. Uh, lastly, I'll say here that, um, you know, I believe very, very deeply in finding your lane, getting in it and playing it very well. Um, and staying coordinated, right? And communicating with other folks. I'm following that fight, but I know that Kim Crenshaw and that crew, right? <laughs> they are ready to fight and that is, that is their lane and they know how to do this. And so what I can do is help amplify and I can just help flank. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to kind of the attacks on the civil liberties of protesters and people like me who, you know, the, the, the federal government is now convening task forces to investigate uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter and, you know, anybody who threatens the established order. Um, I've now had to become an expert in security. I mean, I'm getting phone calls just today about, you know, other movement leaders who are being attacked in, in the communities that they're organizing and realizing, right, that we have a real dearth of infrastructure in terms of political security for um, the leaders that we ask to be courageous in these moments. So um, I am very focused on that. I'm very, very focused on the project of Black political power with 20 something days to the upcoming election. It's critical that our communities are mobilized and activated. And I'm super, super focused on getting this book into people's hands so that we have the tools we need to keep fighting no matter what happens on November 3rd or after. Great, you know, I, I'm in this work in many ways and have been for nearly 30 years because of my father who has been in this work for twice as long, which I can't fathom but he's spent six decades really pursuing racial and social justice. And now as a semi-retiree, he's glued to the TV watching CNN and MSNBC, watching the world burn. Yeah. What can I tell him he has to look forward to? What do you wanna be able to come back and report to us on this stage in five years that we've managed yeah. to accomplish? I want you to be able to say to him that we get it, that we're fighting like hell and we're not just working to tear things down. We are working to build new things and we are fighting for hearts and minds. And that is why um, this country is burning right now. Honestly, it's because of the fact that um, we've been so successful in our attempts to change hearts and change minds that there is always swift backlash to change. But what we also know is that black people have endured much, much more. Black communities have endured much, much more and we will make it and we will stay the course and we will stay committed. I really appreciate that. You know, I feel like you've done and seen so much. You, you could write a book. In fact, <laughs> maybe you have. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I did. So the book is called The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. And it is not a Black Lives Matter story, although Black Lives Matter is included in it. It is really a chronicling of um, how we come to be movement builders and how we build the kinds of movements that can endure and the kinds of movements that can bring about the changes we need in our lives. And it's told from my perspective, using my experiences, talking about the things I'm learning, the things I've learned, the things I'm unlearning and the things I'm still not sure about. 
And what I'm hoping is that this book can be a method that each of us uses to better understand the conditions that we're living in, to help us shape the role that we want to play in the lane that we want to get in, and to help make us courageous enough to be the fighters that we need for the future that we deserve. Appreciate that. The last thing I'll ask before we make our transition is um, our audience is corporate you know, philanthropy and uh, social responsibility professionals, but also people in community. Yep. Any last words of wisdom for how they can lean into this moment and maintain balance and self-care to be sure to be the most they can be to support these causes? Yeah, use your role. Use your role to make change, whatever that role is. And I really want to be clear about that. I think um, lots of people think, well, I'm not a protester or, you know, I'm not an activist. This is why I wrote this book. I believe that everybody can be an organizer. Everybody can be a movement builder. So use your role and use your position. Do what you're good at, amplify it and do it well. That might be bringing people together. It might be helping people access more information. It might be um, resolving conflict, right? We definitely need more conflict resolution in our lives. Whatever it is, everybody has something to contribute and we need your hands. Many hands make light work as, as they say. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a bonus question from the audience. Uh, it's about the poem that uh, the June Jordan. Yes, yeah, so if you yes. could share a little bit about that because I know some curiosity in the audience. This poem is one of my favorite poems by June Jordan. It's part of a much longer poem called A Poem About My Rights. And it is the last nine lines of the poem. I encourage you to go read it. It's incredible. And I think also um, very suiting for this moment. Deeply appreciate it. We have our homework. If you don't know the poem, please do. If we were in a room, we would spend the next four minutes in our standing ovation. But let me speak on behalf of our audience and thanking you with deep appreciation, not just for this conversation, but for everything you do. Thank you, Dwayne, and congratulations on your new role. Kick butt, we need you. Absolutely, thanks so much.